Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Walking and talking with my mind stayed on Jesus. Walking and talking. song with my mind on Jesus. singing this song with my mind stay on Jesus singing this song with my mind stay on Jesus hallelujah 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 the joy that I have the world didn't give it to me this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. this joy and this joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me. This joy. Jesus gave it to me. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. The world is given and the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Give a clap on tonight, Jesus. At your feet. Lord, I bow. Search me, O oh God, and know me now. Take this sin from my heart. I want to be just as you are. I want to be.
tonight. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for the needs that we lifted up last night, praying for a young man from Las Vegas by the name of Frankie Gonzalez, that God would do a miracle for him, and also for McKenna Carter, a young woman from Aurora, Colorado. She's 18 years old, has cancer, she's battling that. You know what? She's too young. We would need to pray God completely heals our sister. And does a miracle there. Let's pray out together. Then as we subside, Pastor De Leon is going to come and open us in prayer tonight. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe you, Lord God. We worship and glorify your holy and mighty name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. Father in heaven, we pray right now, Lord God, for your anointing to be on this place, Lord God, that you would pour out your spirit, Lord Jesus. We ask you right now, Lord God, that you would just take all distractions and that we, Lord God, would surrender our hearts unto you, Lord, in this place. We pray right now, Lord God, as you move in these early stages of this conference, Lord God, that you would continue to do what you're doing in this place, Lord God, stirring hearts, Lord God, lifting up your people, Lord God. We pray right now for your dominion, Lord Lord God, we pray right now, Lord God, that we would just be strengthened, Lord, and I pray for the hearts to be open in this place, Lord God, that we would all be led to you more and more, and we thank you for your mercy, we thank you for your grace and your anointing, and we praise you in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, we appreciate that you can take your sit seats this evening, amen, appreciate you being with us here. In conference, what a wonderful time we've had, just a supernatural visitation of God, and we expect the same even tonight, amen. Just a couple of quick announcements, uh, uh, just, uh, uh, re just remember your conduct in the hotels, restaurants, uh, uh, Pastor Dan was telling me that the lady at the Hillcrest said that if we would go there, you know, uh, when we're done here, she will stay open till about 9.15, give or take, so... Amen. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, she wants to stay open for us. So thank God for that. Uh, but uh, there's just one a small concern tonight concerning the Best Western. Uh, uh, the manager called me. He asked if, uh, uh, he said he, ha he had about 80 kids in the pool, you know, uh, approximately. And so he's asking if you're not a registered guest there, uh, please don't allow your, your kids, uh, uh, you know, to, to go there. So he would appreciate that. Amen. Uh, just remember, the uh, be a good tipper when you go to these restaurants. Uh, as, as far as I understand, so far so good. Uh, just remember the parking lot is open now. Thank God, the Walmart parking lot. And you can park right over there. Well, so we have a lot of attendants or a couple of attendants that are helping us tonight. So please just uh, help them. Uh, follow their instruction and, and then there will be a blessing. Please be careful as you're exiting also these parking lots crossing that street right there and please uh, keep an eye on your kids um, remember to uh, pick them up right after children's church and nursery amen and that would be a blessing to them and do this all immediately right after service uh, the evening prayer is starts at six 
and uh, goes to 645. Also, uh, the uh, sanctuary doors are uh, open at 6 p.m. So keep that in mind. And then just remember, uh, we, we need God to help us. So uh, morning prayer is at 8 o'clock. And then we're going to start begin our, our seminars. We have a great a lineup uh, nine o'clock in the morning we have jerry martinez uh, 9 45 isaiah trujillo and then at 11 in the morning we have pastor gary marsh and he will also be with us again in the evening at 7 p.m amen so remember those things uh, and just come and lay a word of god again at 6 p.m just uh the, remember that they're selling cds back there the set is 50 dollars. the individual sermons are three dollars each uh, if you have your own thumb drive, uh, Victor is willing to give you a discount and put each sermon in there for a buck. So uh, just see him about that. Then uh, uh, T-shirts, uh, $10 a piece. And then uh, the last day to order, all these things, is Thursday night. Amen. That's all the announcements, uh, except that we do have uh, the highlights of our conference, or the reports uh, uh, from these men. Amen. They're going to come in this order. Don Rivera, Antonio De Leon, Joshua Sanchez, David Vigil, and Jerry Martinez. This welcome Pastor Don Rivera as he comes. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to give glory to God tonight, first of all, uh, for my wife, Elaine, uh, who supported my ministry uh, all of these years. Hallelujah. And all the encouragement she gives me. Baby, I love you. Now, Pastor Trujillo said, <laughs> he said, a lot of these pastors, they have to pump up their wives because they've been such boneheads all year. I said, that's good advice. Thank you. <laughs> but I do want to say that the pastor's wives in this fellowship uh, needs to get a lot of credit for all they do because they're usually the janitors. Uh, my wife's a fellowship coordinator, uh, bookkeeper, nursery attendant, and everything else uh, in, um, in the church, including construction workers. Go, Gina. <laughs> they just got a new building, and Gene is there helping along. Hallelujah. Uh, so uh, we pastor in a, a city called Taylorsville, which is in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I like to say Taylorsville because we are still the murder capital of Utah. And I do have a theory. I do think that uh, all the surrounding cities uh, kill their people and drop them off in our town. <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, it makes sense. Hallelujah. Um, so my prayer uh, for our church is that, uh, um, or my prayer is that our church brings life to a dying city. Amen. So we have a beautiful facility that we meet at. Everyone who comes uh, are blown away uh, how nice our facility is. Mostly pastors, if they come in, uh, people who attend the church, they think it's just there and whatever. But pastors come in and they're just blown away how God has truly blessed us in that facility. And it's just a really great place. Uh, we uh, are getting visitors to our church, uh, and a lot of them are starting to lock in, and so we're excited about that. But I want to say this. Most of the people who come to visit our church are usually brought by people in the church, and they're usually family members. So listen to me. Do not under underestimate the influence that you have on your family. I recently did a funeral. Uh, we prayed with a lot of visitors there, and uh, I love doing funerals. Uh, I learned how to do funerals from Pastor Ruby. I, um, we did a funeral. He did a funeral. Uh, I did the music, and after the service, everybody was walking up to me. They thought I was him, and they said, what a great sermon I preached. And I took all the credit, obviously. I didn't tell them it was him. <laughs> I just went, thank you. Anyway, so I learned to love to do funerals. I mean, you know, sad they're gone, but hallelujah, that's a good place to win people. But uh, we, um, uh, we, uh, pray, I prayed, uh, uh, sinners pray with a number of people there, and uh, uh, a lady got saved, and, and uh, she, well, a number of people got saved, and, and a lady's coming to our church from that right now, so we're excited for that. And um, so uh, we have a small um, group a music group uh, of 60s and older. No, no, we don't just do 60s music, but we're all over 60. <laughs> and we played in Wendover, Nevada recently, uh, and the young people uh, who, you know, go to that church weren't sure if they were supposed to like the old people music, uh, and, you know, because it was so groovy. I, I mean, sick. But Pastor George uh, Espinosa brought it into a perspective with his young people. He said that if old people can still do it, how much more uh, the youth need to raise up? Can you hear an amen tonight? 
See, we have a really small church here in uh, Taylorsville uh, with a bunch of big believers who still want to make an impact in our city and state and even our nation. And we brought a couple with us, Jim and Kathy. They're, uh, they're such a great couple. They're a perfect example of what our church is about. I want to thank Pastor Ruby and Patsy for all your generosity and your goodness. Thank you. My name is Antonio De Leon, me and my beautiful wife, Angelia. We pastor in Clifton, Colorado. Amen. And I just want to start by giving a big thanks to my pastor, Pastor Martin, Sister Nicole, Pastor Ray, Sister Patsy, the Las Vegas congregation. I also want to thank uh, the Romeros for the great work that they did there and what, continue on what they're doing. Amen. And so we want to thank them. Um, I wanted to start off by saying um, we were in Delta, Colorado for about two years. Amen. And so I cannot go without saying anything about that. Um, in the uh, month of May, we had a revival with Pastor Mario Sanchez right before he went off to be a missionary. Uh, it was a powerful, powerful time because we had a couple, uh, a young lady and her dad come in. And so the, the great thing was I handed this flyer out uh, in January in the middle of winter, which really isn't winter. But we were there in the parking lot of Walmart. I handed out a flyer to this lady. She took it. She says, yeah, I'll check you out. Like I said, we always hear that. She never showed up. Well, come four months later, this man showed up. And I asked him how he heard of us. He said, you handed my wife a flyer, and now I'm here. She didn't show up yet. So this man came in right be a week before revival. He said, I'll be back comes back. We had a revival with Pastor Mario Sanchez for Mother's Day. Um, he told his daughter, if you want to see your kids, you will meet me at church. She, they came back. She came. She got saved. Not only did she get saved, she got delivered from drugs. Pastor Mario prayed with her. The powerful thing about all of that is two months later, being now three months, whatever it is, uh, we were there working with them. And they were just being radically saved. They bring in family members from New Mexico, bringing them back to Colorado to get saved, baptized. We were able to baptize two of their family members. And the greatest thing of all, as we were making our transition into Clifton, they wanted us to stay, stay, stay. I told them the need. I told them how God had called us. And so as I was telling them this, they came, they transitioned with us to Clifton. But they said, Pastor... I need to talk to you. So I said, okay, what's, what's the deal? They called me over to their house. They said, I want your blessing. And I was like, blessing for what? And they're like, we want to keep this church open. And I said, okay, um, well, you don't need my blessing. You're doing something for Jesus. The cool thing was, is right before we left, a pastor and his wife came in. from. They retired from Assemblies God Church. They went in. They told the family they would be their pastor and today there is still a church in delta colorado because of what jesus did through this family amen so i wanted to just note that but now that we're in clifton colorado god is still moving god is working a powerful work there continuing that on we have great disciples great men of god amen they are a great help great families amen so just keep praying for them uh, there are some assaults going on but you know what that's in any church amen but you just keep praying for them praying for all the families involved we had concerts and concerts over and over i'm getting the flicker we had a revival with pastor martin in august Amen. We saw one woman get saved and uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so she's still around. She's still coming faithfully. And so you continue to pray for us as we pray for you. Thank you. Amen. My name is Joshua Sanchez and my wonderful, beautiful, amazing wife. She's my hero, Erica Sanchez. And now our two nephews, uh, we pastor the wonderful town of Mammoth, Arizona. The one flag right there, we're there. That's us. And so uh, just real quickly, in November, we have, the, we have our brother who's been, uh, he's a drummer now, and uh, he's been coming to our church five years faithfully. His wife showed up for the first month and, and, uh, and stopped coming. And, and so uh, he just said, I told him we're going to keep praying. We've been praying. And I told him one service. He, you know, he's like, man, this is going on. And I said, I, I see God just bringing in your wife, saving her, and she's going to sit in the chair with you there. And that same night, I got a call. I'm like, who's this? It's his wife. She's calling. Uh, it wasn't a good conversation. It was a, hey, this and this. And I'm like, okay. A month later, in comes Brother Paul in December. And right behind him is his wife. She comes in. She prays. 
Uh, she comes back into the church. She's a blessing. She's here tonight, and, and she's on fire for Jesus. She's always, uh, just today, she was tell, uh, yesterday, she was telling us, hey, we got to go do this outreach. Let's reach these people. Let's feed them. Let's do whatever we got to do. Amen. And then also, we, uh, we dedicated six children this year, and uh, it's just a blessing. We have 14 kids in our church, one toddler. They're all between the ages of 7 and 12 years old. God's moving there. Uh, in February, my Nana Norma, she passed away. I went to be with Jesus, one of the most difficult things that I've, had, I've had to deal with. But out of that, there was 120 people that, uh, that came in, family members for the, um, the, the funeral. People prayed to get saved. But after that, my brother Jeremy, he was backslidden for a long time, bound by drugs. And he would call me, tell me he wanted to kill himself. I said, Jesus is the answer. Come back home. He comes in right after he gets saved radically. He's coming to church. He's living for God. He's on fire for God. Let's go do something for Jesus. He's here tonight also. Um, as in God's doing something. And then real quickly, uh, in, in April, we got a call. I got a call that was just, uh, it's mind-blowing. You're, you're, you know, you're not a miracle worker. You just trust God. Uh, a couple, 25 and, and uh, 31, they're there. He calls me saying, hey, you know, the doctor says I got to operate on my brain. I have a tumor in my brain. They need to operate immediately. Moki, Andrew Moki, Moki says, I have a, a hole in my heart. I have to get surgery. I believe God. And so we're going we're gonna to believe God. We bind this. And God's a healer. He's a miracle worker. I preached a sermon called, Do You Still Believe in Miracles? Laid hands on him, felt God say that he's healed. And I told him that. He went to the doctor as he got there. Uh, Moki didn't need surgery, none of that. Uh, and a miracle there. But then Brother Andrew calls and says, Look, they said it was a cyst. And it was 12 millimeters, went down to six. They said they misdiagnosed. They said misdiagnosed nothing. Jesus Christ healed him. And lastly, very lastly, I want to say we have men rising up. We have a band. We had three men preach, Brother Phil, my brother Jeremy, and Brother Paul preached uh, a, a, a men's tag team. I want to thank Pastor Ray, this congregation. Most of all, I want to thank the Mammoth congregation. Pray for us as we pray for you. And my name is David Behill. Me and my wife and four kids are uh, in Montrose, Colorado. If you're not sure where that is, it's the better side of Colorado for all you front rangers who've never been there. But uh, just kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Um, so we've been there now like four years or so. It's been good. Our church is growing, but not with new converts. There's a family in our church who's cranking out them babies. We've got like four boys. It's just uh, it's been good. But uh, we've been uh, just having outreaches in the park and neighborhoods and stuff. And every time I call an outreach, people show up from our congregation and then just faithful going down, going down the farmer's market. They're always there with me, just passing out flyers and stuff, trying to get them involved in doing stuff outside of Montrose. We took a team down to Durango to meet the new pastor from out of Prescott, uh, Tony Begay, down in Durango. Took a team down there, outreached all day. It was good, rained, but still got a bunch of flyers out. Uh, what else? Oh, we... Uh, uh, took three, brought three kids to boot camp, two of our own, but one was out of the fruit of the Delta Church. A young girl, Kiona, she had a good time. She said she wants to go back next year, so hopefully that will work out. Uh, still trying to stay in contact with some of them and just uh, keep in touch with her. My daughter talks to her and stuff, so that we have a re relationship with, with them still. That's good. And uh, what else? Oh, uh, a while back, my daughter had... Uh, showed me a text of hers from a, this kid at her school, and it said, this text was pretty terrible, actually. It said, uh, it was a text from the mother of this 13-year-old boy telling him, you know, just she's tired of him. He's just kill himself already. So my daughter showed me this text, and I was like, that's crazy. My daughter's, you know, freaking out, and I was like, man, what kind of mother, you know? And Well, weeks went by, and uh, we were on an outreach, uh, uh, Pastor Vince, Pastor Antonio, and the guys from Junction were all passing out flyers there in Montrose, and my daughter texted me saying, you know, well, he did it, you know, he took some stuff or whatever, and he's uh, in a hospital in Denver, and uh, his heart had just stopped, and then we were just, we continued on the outreach, I was praying, as we were walking through the neighborhood, passing out flyers, I'm praying, and saying, God, you know, keep this kid alive, so I could just get a chance, an opportunity with him, and uh, she texted me again, says his heart uh, they keep stopping. They can't, uh, they, they can't get this under control. Well, by the end of the outreach, my daughter had said, you know, it's too late. It's gone. The family's coming in. It's over for him. Well, we didn't really have all the details. So we get back to my house for some fellowship. We all get in a circle and we just begin to pray, pray for this kid and just believe God. And well, hours went by and they were able to just bring him back. And he's 
All right, well, what I did was I was praying on the outreach as we're walking there through the streets. I'm like, God, give me another opportunity with this kid. We had uh, played, me and uh, Pastor Antonio had got to play basketball with him uh, months prior to that. We were there walking uh, and just hanging out at the rec center playing ball. And, uh, well, God did. God kept him alive. Uh, it was like a timing of God. I was, one day I was going to the rec center to go pay uh, our membership for my family a couple blocks from my house. And I seen him pull up on his bike. And he gets down, and I'm there, I'm talking to him, and we just start shooting some hoops together. And I said, hey, what, uh, you hungry? He's like, yeah. I was like, let's go get a burger. And I took him, Sonic, we got a burger. I just took him for a ride through town. I just parked there with him and just prayed with him. It was cool. It was just, uh, just a great answer to God's prayer, just a miracle. It was just a great moment. God answered that prayer and just gave me an opportunity to pray with this young man. And I just believe God for him and just to keep, uh, just for more opportunities with him. Just a great time. Uh, God's good to us in Montrose. It's been it's been good. Just church is is we didn't see this year what we've seen in other years. We haven't had the visitors that we've had in the past, but we have our faithful core who's just faithful, helping, you know, paying the bills, giving, and just supporting. It's a miracle what God's done there. And just continue to pray for us as we pray for you and thank Pastor Ray Patsy and uh, all the Vegas congregation for your investment in Montrose, Colorado. Amen. Praise God. Amen. My name is Jerry Martinez. My beautiful wife, Rachel, and our four boys, we pastor the metropolis that is known as Mora, New Mexico. Amen. And God is moving. God is on the throne there. Uh, last year, uh, at the end of, you know, we left conference and just continued doing what we do. And in December, we had uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas play come up from Las Vegas, come help us. And in that, in that uh, Christmas play, we had 75 people come out, uh, packed out our little church. And uh, at the end of the night, five people had given their lives to Jesus. Out of that was one couple that, uh, you know, here it is right around Christmas, holidays get busy, and, uh, and so we enter the new year into the fast. January, we begin fasting, begin praying. Uh, I get a phone call from one of the men, that, that couple that had come. He wants to meet with me. He's saying, Pastor, we're looking for a church. We want Jesus to help us. We need God. And, and so he says, can we come to your church? I'm like, of course. So, we, uh, so he starts, him and his wife start coming to our church. Uh, Within the next month, within just a few services, he brings in his his son, his uh, his stepson, and uh, and his and and her, his her. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the, the family, you know, everybody comes in. And so, uh, uh, so they, you know, that there's a family of five. And so they start coming. Within a couple of weeks, you know, uh, we, we we're getting visitors off of this and everything. And, and so uh, through it all, we've, we've grown. We've had an increase um, in about 18 people that have just started coming off of that one couple that, that came to the Christmas play. Um, amen. And uh, last year, last, last spring, I was offered a, a position to assist the, the head coach of the baseball team to, to become an assistant coach. And so I took up the offer and I said, I, I, I'll help you. It can't conflict with my schedule at the church. And he says, no, I understand. You, I just need your help here at practice. If you can show up on games, you can be a part. You know, I just need as much help as you can give me. So we helped him last season. This season, he asked me, he said, I, I need you again. So again, the same thing. And, and, and it, just the impact of uh, having of, of being there opened up doors where these boys are asking me before games, Pastor, we want you to pray for us. We want you to help us. You know, let, let's go to God. And so before each game, we're kneeling out in center field. We're praying, getting, you know, laying hold of God. Out of that, the head coach starts coming to our church, him and his wife and, her, and their family. Amen. Um, Another one of the boys who's on the team uh, just been real, you know, one of these kids that in school, they kind of push him away. Teachers don't like him. Kids don't like him. Give him a hard time. Uh, he start. he, he, uh, he, you know, I'm always witnessing to this kid at, at, at games, things like that. He'd blow up and I'm pulling him off to the side, kind of getting into DI mode with this boy, you know, and just, but just, you know, he, he listens, he respects. And one day, you know, he, he was at our house with the boys, with my boys playing guitars and stuff. And I, we invited him to go with us to the youth convergence 
in Tucson. This boy's never stepped foot in my church. Every time we'd offer, he'd say, no, you, I don't want to be preached to. I don't want to be preached to. He goes with us to Tucson on the youth convergence. You know, God touches him. He doesn't respond, but he shows up again to church just a couple Wednesdays uh, uh, back. And God's moving slowly in this boy's heart. But you can see what God's doing in that youth convergence. We took nine teenagers with us. You know, and so God's moving. God's really helping us. We're, we're seeing fruit from outreaches, uh, you know, years and years and years of investment and labor pastor martin pastor joseph myself you know laboring and doing what god's wanting we're starting to see fruit and and you know god's starting to bring it in the, in the quality of people that are getting saved you know people that that are that have a vision to see other people people that have a burden to see people saved and so i just thank god there's so much more i can i could be here all night but god is faithful god's on the throne i want to thank pastor ray uh sister patsy this congregation you, you guys are such a blessing just to have you and you know we call for an outreach and you show up and i thank god for for every one of you that are praying for us keep us in prayer amen we're going to take more off for jesus amen hallelujah and so amen i'm here to take the offering which is a good thing praise god now this morning amen i preached a sermon called death from above and in it, I referenced David and Goliath and how David won the battle from the air. But the other side of that is that he used stones or things from the earth to win the battle. And so Mark chapter 16, verse 20 says, And they went out and they preached everywhere while the Lord was working with them, confirming the message by the attesting signs and miracles that closely accompanied it and then it says amen which means so be it and so we understand that uh, God is the one you know when I was the assistant pastor here I, I remember the bills I mean I, I remember you know I was involved integrally in all the things that were happening and I have to be honest with you it would blow my mind because I'm thinking man <laughs> This, this is a giant. This thing is big, and it's ugly, and it's smelly, and this is big. And I have to be careful. You know, I mean, I, I take this with the right understanding. I used to think, man, you know, I love my pastor. He's nuts, man. <laughs> Just on top of sending people to other nations. And so this is this humongous giant that if you begin to look at, can begin to freak you out. Now again, we understand that above represents the realm of the spiritual or the realm of prayer. And we understand that prayers win battles. And uh, believe me, we've prayed, amen, for money, and uh, we have prayed that God would move uh, in a powerful way. But see, the other side of that uh, is that He uses stones. Things from the earth or things from below. And what that tells us is that what topples the giant are the things from below. Prayer connected with things from below. Or in other words, he uses human instruments. And so let's apply that to giving. Because it's one thing to pray for the world. Say, oh, God, touch the nations. I don't think there's a man in here, a pastor in here, a disciple in here, that when you begin, when you hear that, there's something that rises up inside of you. There's something, man, that just boils over, and you're thinking, God, touch the nations. God, touch, man, just nations. How cool it will be when we get to heaven and people come up that we don't even know. And say, I'm from such a, I was from such a, and I don't know if this is happening just in my mind, but you know, they'll say, I was from such and such a place. And this was my life. And because you prayed, and because you gave. Here's my family. Think about that. The impact of something we do here on earth that wins the battle and that touches eternity. And see, we pray and that's good. But then God turns to us and says, pick up the stones. And in this case, pick up your wallets. 
to act upon what we've just prayed for. How many know sometimes, amen, we pray and then we begin to explain why God can't do what we just prayed for. And so God now says, listen, he's got, he's got plans for us. There's giants to topple. Can you say amen? How many have been ministered already by the preaching? And so now it's time to give because that's where the real test of appreciation is. What will cause, you know, appreciation will cause our money to follow. I remember a long time ago, and uh, I've heard variations of this, but I remember a long time ago, and God brought this to my mind, about a, a certain village that was by the sea, by the, by the ocean. And, you know, kids, they were playing in the water, and as they're there playing, there's an undertow, and it grabs, amen, this son, this, this boy, little boy, and uh, he, he was the son of a widow woman, the only son that, 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 that she had, and begins to pull him out. And so, you know, people are trying to rescue him, and they can't rescue him, and he's getting further and further. They're hearing these desperate cries. The mother's on the shore. She's weeping. She's frantic. She's just, you know. And so out of nowhere comes this man this this strong man he was the strongest man in the village he was the strongest swimmer in the village and he comes and he picks up a rope and he ties it around his waist and he leaps out and he battles this thing and he grabs the child and everybody's ecstatic everybody's excited what a powerful thing has just happened in front of us the only problem was nobody held on to the rope you know our mama's on the shore and there are babies, ones that we have, and ones that are still crying out for us. Come save me. I'm in an undertow. Nations of the world. And I was saved in this church way ago. I was one of the first founding members. And I can remember when, to us, it was amazing that we would plant one church out. It was amazing. You know, we thought, okay, that's it, we're done. Because, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's the epitome of success. And then one church turns into two, turns into three, turns into five, turns into 20, turns into 25. And we have conference. You, you don't understand, really. I mean, you're excited about, and everybody's, but you don't understand what that means to somebody who was here from the beginning. That God could do this in a city that nobody's even heard of. You know, I'm from Mesquite, and, and the other Las Vegas is about 90. So I, I tell them, yeah, we're going to Las Vegas. And they're like, you're in Las Vegas. No, 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 the other Las Vegas. There's another Las Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> we were found first. They built the casinos here. Otherwise, they'd be saying, Las Vegas, Nevada? <laughs> and to see what God has done. You know, over the years, our kids are preachers. And powerful preachers. And their kids are lining up. And the impact that this little church that nobody ever heard of at the end of the highway. You know the highway used to end here? That's the only reason this place exists. Before they built the bypass, you got to come through Las Vegas. Because the highway ends. This is the end of the road. And so now to leave our mama crying on the beach without holding the rope. That's wrong. That's unrighteous. Listen to me. That's unrighteous. And so tonight, amen, we need lots of money. There's a giant. But you know, there's enough stones here. If people will simply value. Do you value? I mean, it's one thing to pray. Say, oh, God, thank you. It's another thing to show how your value is. And so, amen, I'm going to have the ushers come. It says the Lord working with them. Death from above includes things from below. And so tonight, amen, let's give. And some of you have already written your checks out, and I want to challenge you. Listen to what God is saying. Listen to what God is saying. What an investment. What a powerful thing is happening this whole week. Destinies are entered. Who knows what could happen?
I freak my people out all the time. I say, man, who knows what could happen? You're not leaving, Pastor. No, no, no. Who knows what could happen? <laughs> who knows what could happen? You know, I, we love our pastor, but, you know, we know how he works. You know, why not send three out, serve, you know, churches overseas? Why not, you know? But see, in order for him to do that, for mama to be able to have her child, somebody has to hang on to the rope. Where are your hands tonight? Are they on the rope? You know, nowadays when a tragedy happens, everybody pulls up their cell phone. Nobody helps, but they'll pull out their cell phone. Because they want to be the first to post it on Facebook or Twitter or Cricket or whatever. I don't know. Let's not be the people with the cell phones. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. Yeah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity. That you have looked upon us, God, at the end of the road. And Father, in your goodness and mercy, you have chosen us, God, to touch the nations of the world so that you might receive the glory and the honor, God. It is yours, Father. And tonight, I pray that you would stir the hearts of men and women to give. And Father, in reality, we give to you what's already yours, Lord. Everything we have is yours, and everything we are, you have made us, God. And so we do not give you, Father, what is ours, but we give to you of what you have already given us. And I pray that you would stir us for the nations of the world. God, we thank you that you're in this place. We can sense and feel your presence, your spirit brooding. And I pray as we obey, God, that you would multiply, that you would bless, Lord, the gift and the giver. God, that you would cause this giant, Lord, to be felled by the stones, Lord, that are in this congregation. And we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. And the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. The world can't take it away. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. This joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me, this joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me, this joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me, and the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me, and the world can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me, the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Thank you. Amen. We have some special music. Uh, these are all pastors' kids. They get together to put do a song for us. Let's welcome them as they come right now. Amen. Uh, so while they're coming out, I'm Emma, uh, Pastor Adam Peebles' daughter. I live here in Vegas, go to school here in the nursing program. Uh, and while this past month, my car has been suffering demon possession, <laughs> and it has not been fun. Uh, so thank God for my brother Samuel, because Lord knows I have a hard enough time being a woman, let, al let alone being a, trying to be a man and fix my car. Just kidding, you don't have to be a man to fix your car. But um, we were just changing out different parts, and I was praying, and my dad's there on FaceTime, and he's like, did you change this? Did you change that? We're like, yes, we did this, we did that. And I was just getting like a very angry heart. Like, God, you're supposed to be taking care of me. Like, just making that my main focus and really like losing sight of everything. And 
I remember I had orientation for, um, for nursing and the, we do some clinicals at the state hospital. And I remember just some of the things that they were telling us that those patients go through. Um, they suffered from being victims of sexual abuse, from drug-induced psychosis, from self-mutilation. And I was sitting there and my heart was breaking for these people that I never met. And I'm like, here you are being so tonta, caught up in your own problems, like, and you don't even realize the world of hurt that's out there, how many people are actually suffering and they're broken and they're lost. And these people, they don't have anybody. And I remembered um, just from that day on, like my attitude changed and I was grateful. And I was like, okay, thank you, God. I know it's still like possessed, but you're gonna help me. And um, within the next couple of days, I was able to um, talk to a few girls that were in the nursing program with me and invite them to church. And, you know, they haven't came yet, but it was sowing seed and going back to the conference theme changed lives, changed lives. And even though my life wasn't significantly changed, it was just a small change of attitude that caused, um, that allowed an opportunity for me to sow a little bit of seed. So I encourage you guys, I know we have our own problems, we have our own issues, but if we take our eyes off ourselves and put them on Jesus and lift them up and see that the harvest really is ready. So I hope you guys understand or enjoy this song. Carry your compass. 
Awesome. Praise God. Tonight, we're very blessed to have Pastor Gary Marsh with us. And I asked Pastor Marsh to preach at our conference because I've had the opportunity, the blessing of preaching in his church in Glendale, Arizona, the Phoenix area, and got to know Pastor Marsh. And Pastor Marsh represents in a lot of ways what this fellowship is all about. The reason why we are impacting the world in our generation is, because, is something that his life represents. What I mean by that is that many years ago, the church in Prescott sent a couple into a suburb of Phoenix. They got a storefront building, started from scratch, some chairs, some equipment, began to reach out to people. Pastor Marsh was among a very small handful of people to go into that storefront and get saved, him and his wife, many years ago. And now he's the pastor of that church. And there have been other, a number of other pastors over the years, and God used him in other places, but he brought him back to what was his original mother church. And he's pastoring that church now for a number of years. In, this little, in the suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, began in a storefront. He was a disciple raised up in that church. And he's preached all over the world. Now he's raised that church to the place where they're planting workers among the nations of the world. Half of the churches out of his church are international churches. And I saw that. And he's in a storefront and, you know, in a shopping center which means when you got to grow, you get the space next to you. And then you uh, fix it up and uh, you do what you can do with it. And his building is kind of an L-shaped building because that's the space they have. But God is doing a, such a powerful work in and through that congregation in Glendale, Arizona. And it's like Pastor Marsh is of the opinion, you know, there's, not a, uh, there, there's nothing God can't do through this this church and we're going to do something for God and that's exactly what he's doing when I saw that I said you know Pastor Marsh can you come to Las Vegas New Mexico and preach in our conference because we need to hear what you have to say about what God is doing and so he agreed he's going to be preaching tonight tomorrow morning and tomorrow night and so we're in for a great blessing let's welcome him as he comes right now amen thank you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As uh, Pastor Ray said, we meet in the storefront, and uh, in all honesty, I am exceedingly jealous at the height of this ceiling right here. You could put two of our buildings in, in this up and down space right here. But God has helped us. I'm, uh, I, am, I have a great privilege of pastoring people who made pledges to put me in the ministry. Uh, because there's a number of very long, long-term people in our church that, uh, that made pledges, put me in the ministry. I'm, I pastor people I used to play on the platform with for song service. Uh, it's just a great thing. I, I call myself a homeboy 
because I pastor the, uh, in this, well, the Phoenix area at least, which is where I grew up, and uh, I pastor my home church uh, with people that have been family to me for a long, long, long time. I'm very, very privileged to have this opportunity. I don't know that I can bring anything that this congregation hasn't heard, and uh, I'm just going to bring what I am and what God's doing in my heart. If you have a Bible, I'd like to open tonight with Galatians chapter 1. And I want to minister on the calling of God. I was a brand new convert, brand new. I was saved on July 4th, 1976. Uh, the Prescott Conference took place the next week. And uh, I didn't know much about Prescott, although I did have a uh, brother-in-law, sister-in-law that lived up there, and it was their witness that kind of led us to the Lord. So we bonsaied up to Prescott for the weekend, and it just so happened we got there and caught the very tail end of the Prescott Conference. I think in 1976 there might have been maybe 15 churches in the entire fellowship, something like that. Uh, maybe 20 at that time. I, I really don't know. But something happened in that Friday. We were there for the Friday night service of the Prescott Conference, July of 1976. And back in those days, Pastor Mitchell would have the, the few pastors that were there representing He'd have anybody that was called to God to stand in the aisle, and then he'd have all the pastors walk down the aisle and pray for them. This all happened at the very end of the night. Well, I didn't stand in the aisle, but I was standing against the back wall because we had a one-year-old child who was getting fidgety, having to sit in church and be quiet. And I finally, uh, you know, just got out of the seat instead of disturbing everybody around us and went and stood on the back wall and tried to calm him down a little bit. Well, uh, one of the brothers came down the line and hand, laying hands on and praying for people. And there was a gap of about maybe six feet between the last person in line and myself. And I'm against the back wall. And he prayed for that last guy and, you know, said an eloquent prayer on him. And he started to turn around. Then he looked at me and he goes, and he walks over and he lays his, <laughs> he lays his hands on me and prayed. And uh, all I can say is, something happened. It took me a long time to figure out what it was, and I'm still not 100% certain, but I'll let you know as soon as I figure it all the way out. But God did something. God put something in my heart. And I've never been able to shake it, even when I've tried. Galatians chapter 1, let's begin in verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles uh, except James, the Lord's brother. And now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judah, which were in Christ. But they, uh, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. I want to talk to you about the call of God. Calling is a common term found in the Christian world, and it's uh, used with many wide and varied meanings. Many approach the calling as if it's, uh, you know, in, in line with a career choice. Do I want to be a, a fry cook or do I want to be a pastor? You know, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, like it's a career choice, and that's the calling really has nothing to do with that at all. Um, some feel that if God hasn't met with you personally and spelled it out in detail what he wants you to do, then you're off the hook. You're not called. You don't have to worry about it. But I want to start by saying I believe the word of God indicates that every believer is called. 
Now, before you uh, get angry at me for saying that, listen and hear me out. Calling is not something we choose. Calling is something we respond to. It's something that we have to uh, sense and respond to. The call of God is actually misunderstood by most believers in this generation. First and foremost, you have to understand the divine intent that the real issue in calling is not what do I want to do, what do I feel he wants me to do. That's, that's really not what it's about. The real issue in calling is divine intent. It's not so much an issue of what we're called or what we want to do, but it involves a much narrower focus than that. And it comes all the way down to what did God intend when he sent the Holy Ghost and established the church in the first century? What was God's intention when he did that? Well, the answer to that is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. When we read these words, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Bible is absolutely clear. It specifically states to us that God's intention is to move upon all the earth, not just by his spirit, not with the, the, the breath of God moving, but through individuals, through people. This conference is about changed lives, changing lives. And this is God's intent in calling, that he is going to move upon all the earth, but God intends to do that through believers. Through believers. Paul writes to the believers in Rome in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, and he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. There's your calling right there. The question for the saints, are you going to respond to that call? Are you going to respond to that, or are you just going to do your own thing and take God along for the ride just in case you need him? See, let's not forget we're talking about God's plan to redeem mankind through the words, the testimony, and the deeds of his people. God could save the whole earth like that if he decided to do so. If he decided to just whew, breathe upon the earth and everybody fell out under the power and got up saved, the job would be done. But that's not God's intent. His intent is already spelled out in the Bible. His intent is spelled out clearly that it is through individuals just like you, just like me, who will go into the uttermost parts of the earth and proclaim that message and live that message for others to see. That is how God's intention to save uh, all mankind is to be brought about. Let's not forget, we are talking about God's plan to redeem man through the testimony of his people. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 3 to verse 3 says, This is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So the big picture is fairly clear, and that is, is that God intends for all believers to participate in this in some way. It doesn't mean everyone's going to go out and pioneer a church. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to be an evangelist or a missionary. But God intends that all believers participate in this plan. And I ask, can anyone truly say they're serving God and at the same time say that the call of God doesn't apply to them? I find that to be kind of a contradiction in terms. Pardon me. The church is God's place where calling is cultivated. God designed the church for the specific purpose of cultivating this calling, this elusive thing that some people can never figure out, other people run from with all their might, and other people just surrender to and let God use them. But the church is where this is all cultivated. It's the Petri dish, if you will where this is all to come to pass and where this is to be cultivated. And the church is a ministry of common people. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know what? I read that and I say, thank God there's room for everybody in God's plan. There's room for me. I can find myself in her in a few different places. One of the saddest things you'll ever see are churches advertising for workers in the local newspaper. I'm telling you, this, this, this breaks my heart when I see this. It's pretty common in the Phoenix area. You know, it's a big, massive city. There's churches on virtually almost every corner in some form. And we see these advertisements for people asking for musicians, nursery workers, Sunday school teachers, janitors, uh, uh, all kinds of jobs. Uh, and the reason churches have to do that, it's, it's obvious, because there's no one in their congregation who will respond to the need. There's no one who will put themselves out uh, any more than showing up uh, on Sunday or whatever. Uh, probably most of the time it's because uh, of the added time and effort that's involved. And there's just a lot of people that sit in churches on Sunday but are just not willing to take it another inch beyond that, will not put themselves at all uh, into God's work. And now we understand in our fellowship, thank God, we understand it's a pastor's job to create the culture of discipleship and the ministry opportunities in his church. If you're going to preach discipleship, you better be giving people an opportunity to practice and do something. If you're going to preach discipleship and you're rallying all the men, you better get something going in your church that these men can get involved in or you're going to lose the whole thing. And that's our job as pastors is to cultivate this. And we cultivate discipleship and we, if you have to dream, uh, uh, pray, uh, talk to all your friends, Look online. Find something that you can give people to do that will give them opportunity. And I'm talking ministries, of course. I'm talking music groups, dramas, uh, skit teams. I'm talking outreach teams. I'm talking Bible studies. I'm talking uh, everything you can imagine, youth groups, etc., etc., etc. And the reason we do all these things, we don't do all these things uh, just to keep everybody in the church busy all the time. Our, our calendar in our church is, is always pretty full. And uh, I tell my outreach directors, uh, 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 quite regularly that listen we we've got to we've got to just you know take a little step back and take a deep breath uh you know at least one weekend a month uh, or we try to anyways doesn't always work out that way but folks do have a life outside of church we recognize that but it's our it's our responsibility as pastors to not only challenge people to rise up but giving give them something to rise to and those two have to go hand in hand or you'll never produce anything. So we need to give people an opportunity to rise up, give people a reason to go the extra mile. And then we have to allow them to make mistakes. And we have to allow them to do it wrong. And we have to allow them to follow it all up. And we have to give guys opportunities to develop their preaching skills by preaching to the congregation that loves them even when it's hard to listen to. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. I go to the music scene and I often leave and say, oh my God, we need to work on this a little more. I think he's mentioned Jesus in that message, but I'm not sure. <laughs> People need to learn how to win a soul. People need to learn how to work with a new convert. The sick, oh, there we are need to learn how to recognize needs and respond to them. We need to learn the importance of working together. People need to learn to the under, uh, and, and understand spiritual dominion and how it operates and, and what it's for and what it's not for. And people need to develop skills in ministry. And even if it's serving the greater purpose, 
completely behind the scenes. We have many, 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 many needs in any church that is never going to be in front of everybody, never going to be before the microphone, completely behind the scenes, but oh, how desperately we need those people to respond to the call of God. And especially, especially, I say again, allowing people to fail and pick them up and let them try again. Finding your place in all this is literally what responding to the call of God is. That, that's what it is. It doesn't mean you have to get sent out. It doesn't mean, you know, the, the, the big things we always attach it to. But there's just n numerous, numerous, numerous ways that we can respond, respond to the call of God. And this is every believer's responsibility. Paul says... When God revealed his purpose to me, I didn't talk about it. I just got after it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's what the text we read said. God revealed this to me, and he said, I, I didn't confer with, man, uh, with flesh about this. I just went and got after it. A couple of weeks ago, and I'm sure this congregation can honestly relate to this. The music up here, some things that have been said, I know you can relate to this. We had a farewell fellowship. We had announced a couple at Prescott in July, and we finally got them a building. They're, just, they're actually going to another section of the greater Phoenix area. And so uh, we, we got them a building. We got them all set. So we're having a, a farewell fellowship for them. And we have this sister in our church. Her, they're a great couple. They're a, a little bit older couple. And they've been in the church for many years. And this sister, uh, her ministry is fellowships. I don't have to talk to her. I don't have to ask her. I don't have to arrange anything with her. If I stand in the pulpit some night and I say, oh, by the way, folks, we're having a fellowship next Sunday. She's on it and it happens. And that's it. There's no discussion. There's no, but pastor, a better night would be. None of that. She's on it. It happens. I get a bill for all the supplies, but that's one of the checks I love to write more than any of them because there's lots of good food in them fellowships. It's worth it, man. But this sister is, I mean, it's like clockwork. All, if she hears it over the pulpit, this thing happens. And so we had this fellowship. This is just a couple of Sunday nights ago. And in the, during the time, she said, you know, Pastor, I've been doing this for 33 years now. She said, but this one is special. You know why? Because it was her daughter and son-in-law that we were launching out. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe with all my heart that there's a direct connection this older couple's faithfulness, their involvement. He's on our church council. He's uh, 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 one of our interpreters. We interpret our services into Spanish too. He's one of our interpreters. He's on the church council. She's taken care of the fellowships for the last 33 years. I believe there's a direct connection. In this couple, responding to the call of God, they've never been launched. They, pro they never will be launched. Let's just be honest. I mean... I guess God can do anything, but I don't see it. But anyways, <laughs> they are lovely people. They are wonderful people. And if I hit them up, they'd probably say, no way, you're out of your mind. But I believe there's a direct connection to their responding to the call of God. And we're now launching. This is their baby daughter, by the way. And luckily, we're keeping them close because otherwise uh, I might be in trouble. See, the call of God is designed to constantly challenge us to enlarge our hearts and enlarge our vision. That's what the call of God is designed to do. Again, it's not a career choice. This is God speaking to his people. This is God directing his people. And when you begin to sense and feel God stirring your heart, let me tell you, I know one thing he's trying to do for sure. He's trying to enlarge your heart and your vision. And it always takes us beyond our comfort zone. 
responding to the call of God will take you beyond your comfort zone. And uh, the thing you have to do is at least be saved enough to be able to trust that God knows what he's doing. Listen to our text again. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Uh, think about that for a minute. God revealed to Paul that he was going to go reach the Gentiles. The Amplified Version puts it in these words, that I might proclaim him among the non-Jewish world. Truth be told, the church that began in Jerusalem did suffer a little bit of tunnel vision, didn't they? In the early days of the Jerusalem church, they weren't really interested, or at least not very interested, in anybody that wasn't like them. The early church in Jerusalem was made up of entirely Jews, and they were convinced that salvation was only for the Jews. And so they had a very, very narrow understanding, a very tunnel vision. And so, you know, I mean, I know all the talk today about prejudice and racism, and it just drives me out of my mind. But the reality is, is the early church did suffer a bit of tunnel vision. And it was in Acts 9, Paul is saved along the Damascus Road, and he begins to receive the revelation as God calls him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He later writes to the Ephesian church in, in Ephesians 3.8, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What a privilege he thought this was. What, what an absolute honor this was to this man that God would use me to reach the Gentiles. You know, initially the church in Jerusalem, you, you Bible readers, you know this, the church in Jerusalem wasn't sure this was really God. And they had to have a council about some things that were going on and etc., etc. Acts 10, Peter has his vision of the sheet and all manner of four-footed uh, 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 animals. Uh, and he begins to argue with God. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. I don't touch that stuff. That's not my thing. And God gives Peter a little clarification concerning who's God and who isn't. Helps him enlarge his heart a little bit. And Peter writes... Uh, or he's, the scripture, excuse me, the scripture says in Acts 10, 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The revelation is unfolding. God's plan from the beginning into the uttermost parts of the earth. God's plan from the get-go was all people, all nations, all tongues. And it took the church a while to grow into that understanding. But aren't you thankful tonight that as that understanding came, the church responded to the call of God? Hallelujah. Every believer... Every believer in this building, in my church, and in any church anywhere is called to rise above whatever is limiting your effectiveness. And that's not going to happen unless people respond to God's call. Your pastor can't completely equip you for the job. He's a man. You need God's spirit. And that can be imparted through men. But you need God's Spirit. You need to respond to the call of God. Whatever He's talking to you about. You need to respond to that. We're not in competition. This is not a pyramid scheme. We are not seeking fame, fortune, and recognition. But what we do is we take the call of God seriously. That's what we do. We take it seriously. That call that goes out to every saint and asks the same question of us all. The same question. Will you respond to God's challenge? 
Will you respond? Will you get on board with God's purpose and plan for the church and His purpose and plan for your life? Will you get on board with that? Will you allow God to enlarge your heart? Will you allow Him to enlarge your vision, your understanding? Will you find your place in the call of God? Planting churches is a big part of what we do, and the success of this congregation in church planting is amazing. Amazing. It's a big part of what we do, but planting churches isn't the only thing we do. It takes more than those who will go. It takes those who will send. It takes those who will stay by the stuff, be faithful, serve, find your place, get behind the vision, let God place you into his perfect will in whatever realm that might be. It takes believers who will view whatever they do for God, whatever they do for God as a response to calling that sister in our church that's been arranging fellowships for the last 33 years, that's her calling, buddy. I want you to know. If I asked somebody else to do it, I'd have a fight on my hands. <laughs> Just like if somebody showed up and said, hey, I'm preaching in your church this Sunday. Oh, you think so, huh? <laughs> that's my place, not yours. At least I was invited here. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you. Planning churches is huge. It is a big part of our vision to fill the world with churches. I heard uh, we were at a men's discipleship in Prescott last night. I didn't hear it with my own ears, but one of the brothers I was riding in the car with to get home said he, he asked Pastor Mitchell directly, and our fellowship is now 2,864 churches. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. And this congregation is a result of one of the very first. Imagine that. Imagine that. 2,864 churches later, and you guys are still the fruit of the first one. It's mind boggling. You know why that's happened? Because of people who have responded to the call of God. Not just the 2,864 couples who went, but the many, many, many times more than that who stayed by the stuff and made it possible. It doesn't matter if you're preaching. It doesn't matter if you're serving food. It doesn't matter if you're cleaning floors. Doesn't matter if you're leading a Bible study, playing in a band, acting in a skit, going on outreach, watching the babies, preaching in the music scene, giving financial support, bringing others to church, pioneering a church, serving on the mission field. It's all, it's all about responding to the call of God. Letting Him tell you what he'd like you to do and you say yeah I'll do that Lord and if that's your purpose for me I'll be faithful in that until we get to heaven it's all about responding to the call of God and engaging in God's purposes on earth I'm going to close I'm a short winded preacher by the way Teddy Roosevelt is credit. I've heard many variations of this, but you know, a little research will help sometimes. Teddy Roosevelt, I think, is the one who's credited with at least saying it this way. He said, Do what you can with what you have where you are. Now, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was the President of the United States. I 
in my reading of his life, uh, I think he might have been a religious man, but I'm not sure he was a true born-again believer. But Teddy Roosevelt understood something. In the early days of the nation, when it was expanding its borders, he needed people to get on board with that vision. And he challenged, and he is responsible for a lot of the westward movement into the arena that we're standing in, the area we're in right now. And his theory was do what you can with whatever you've got, wherever you are. And if there's a simple phrase that would sum up responding to the call of God, that would probably be it. Whatever God asks you to do, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that he's interested to see if you will respond to that. And I can tell you, if you want your life to be all that it can be in God's perfect plan, you're going to have to do what God asked you to do. Respond to his call. Let's bow our heads. There's perhaps people here tonight been invited to this service. You're not uh, part of the church here. But maybe you have some family that's here tonight and they've invited you. If you're here as a visitor and you don't know Christ as your Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to come to Jesus Christ tonight. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, not one. And we must all turn to Christ and repent of our sin to be born again. We must be born again. The man in the Bible who went directly to Jesus and said point blank, what do I have to do to make heaven my home? Jesus said, you must be born again. That came out of his mouth. And if Jesus said you must be born again when he walked this earth, then I'd say you still must be born again to ever make heaven your home. If you're here tonight, we're not asking you to join a church. We're not asking you to commit your life to the mission field right now. But if you're not right with Christ, if you don't have any confidence of your sins forgiven, if you don't have any confidence of where you're going to spend eternity when this life is over, you know, life is short. We think we're bulletproof and we think we're going to live forever when we're young and as the years roll by, we soon realize those were foolish thoughts. Somebody said, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. And there's possibly people here tonight that had the best of plans for their life, but for some reason haven't quite been able to put it all together, and maybe you're a little frustrated. Maybe you're a little bitter at some things that have happened in life. Maybe you're just feeling a little, what's the use and who cares? I want to tell you, Jesus cares. He loves you. He cares for you. He has a beautiful plan for your life. He has hope and a glorious redemption that he holds out to you. When I was a little kid, we used to run around the neighborhoods in Phoenix, Arizona, collecting up empty pop bottles. Because back then, we could take them back to the store and redeem them. And we used to get the whopping price of two cents a piece for every soda bottle that we could bring back. And you know, a day's work with three or four kids, we could usually wind up enough to buy a candy bar and a soda pop if we all split the soda pop. And that's my understanding of redemption. Redeeming, chip, dirty, cast out soda bottles. There are possibly people here tonight, you feel just like that. You feel like life has cast you aside. Maybe people you care very much for have discarded you. You might feel like the whole world would just as soon discard you. But I want to tell you, Jesus Christ loves you. He'll redeem you tonight. Not for two cents. With his own blood, he'll redeem you. 
In fact, he's already purchased your redemption. He died on the cross over 2,000 years ago, shed his blood so that you and I could be saved. Is there anyone here tonight? You don't know Christ as your Savior. You're a visitor in church. You're not saved. You're not sure you understand all this, but you feel something right now. And I want to tell you, that's the Spirit of God moving in your heart. If you'd lift your hand and acknowledge that you would like to know this Jesus I'm talking about, you'd like to understand a little more about this, being saved, being redeemed, born again, all you have to do is acknowledge your need and your desire, and Christ will meet with you. A simple prayer is the only thing that stands between you and heaven right now. It's the only thing that stands between you and heaven. A simple prayer. God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Is there anyone who would lift their hand? Anyone at all. Backslider. Unsaved church kid. Anyone at all. You need Christ. I want to change my plea. I want to speak to God's people. And my question, my challenge to you tonight, are you responding to the call of God? If He wants you to go to the far corners of the earth, that's between you and Him. If He wants you to clean the floors and the bathrooms, between services, that's also between you and Him. Are you responding to the call of God? Would you stand with me? These altars are open. Come and find a place to pray. Get a hold of God. Let the Lord deal with your heart tonight. And come, and respond from your heart. And tell God what's going on in your life tonight. We're going to sing a worship song. You lead, brother. Take it away. Awesome is the sight of your holiness. Majestic is your purity. Your righteousness shines brighter than the sun on me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. matchless name worthy 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 is the lamb that was slain that was slain that was slain awesome is the sight of your holy Majestic is your purity, your righteousness shines brighter than the sun on me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. Glory, glory, glory. To his matchless name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that was slain, that was slain. Awesome is the sight of your holiness. Help us sing it, church. Majestic is your purity, your righteousness shines brighter than the sun on me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. Glory, glory. To his matchless name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that was slain, that was slain. Let's worship God together tonight. Oh God of heaven, we magnify you and glorify your wonderful.
to dismiss you tonight I would just remind you that the parking lot right across the street at Walmart is available the fence is open you can park there and come across the street and have a, a quick way out at the end by parking there also reminding you that uh, the parking lot here on the side there are two driveways off of Legion where you can come in and leave 
uh, right off of Legion, not have, even having to come into this parking lot here at the church. Again, an easy way in, easy way out. And, uh, but it's just going to, the crowd's going to get bigger tomorrow night, Thursday, Friday. So come early and pray and uh, save your seat for you and your, your spouse. Please don't just kind of save whole rows, you know, using your belt and your socks and uh, <laughs> your, your gum wrappers and whatnot, you know, because uh, um, so other, cause other people need a pl good place to sit and enjoy the blessing of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads uh, in the presence of God, thanking God for his goodness and all that he's doing in our midst. I'm going to ask if Pastor Anthony Bettis would dismiss us in prayer.